Good evening, all. We just want to thank you uh, for sharing your time with us this evening as we are in our fourth night in the Faith of Jesus series. And these are all critical message from, messages from God's word that are essential for the times in which we're now living. For those of you who don't already know me, my name is Rodney Wire, and I am the pastor for the Rogers Adventist Church here in Arkansas. London Lee, the speaker and director of Ten Talents International, will continue to lead us through our study in the Holy Bible. But before we begin tonight, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, for the technology that allows us in so many different parts of the country to be together and listen and hear what uh, London is going to present tonight in regards to Jesus in the Bible. We ask that you bless us with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the same spirit that inspired holy men of God to write the Bible, and that the Holy Spirit would help us to hear and understand and uh, apply the messages that are coming to us from your word. Bless us with your presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. We want to welcome you. And uh, if you are with us live on Facebook, I want you to do a watch party. Let your friends know that uh, this is going on. So what you do is when you do a watch party, that will let everybody who's on your Facebook be able to watch this presentation. And so you can also share it to different groups that you're uh, a part of. So we want uh, this message to get to those who uh, need to hear the gospel. And so I want to welcome you if this is your uh, first uh, night. Uh, my name is London Lee, and I am excited to be able to share with you uh, the Word of God. And so uh, we are in our fourth night, and we are in uh, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. And what we've been studying has been step by step. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a, a quick uh, review and uh, we're in night number four. And I also wanna remind you all, oh, sorry, thank you. Hold on, thank you. All right, uh, I wanna remind you that at the end of each presentation, uh, those of you who are interested, you can join us uh, on Zoom, the Zoom number is there, and we'll do a question and answer, a discussion about uh, the topic, and we just want to be here to serve you, answer your questions about what we're studying. And so my name is London Lee, I'm Speaker Director of Ten Talents International. Uh, if you would like to know more information about uh, Ten Talents International, you can go to ten-talents.org, you can find more messages and resources there. And so our mission, our vision, our desire is to equip and empower ordinary people to experience transformation through the love of God, to be extraordinary servants, stewards, and leaders in the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And we want to do that one person at a time. And we are excited to be partnering with the Rogers Adventist Church here in Northwest Arkansas. And if you are interested, they have a soup kitchen that they do every Monday and it's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so you can come, now they're doing drive-by. And so you can come and pick up and, uh, and you can uh, come and, and, and be fed not only physically, but we are here to bless the community, serve the community, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And so uh, just a quick review, our first uh, topic was called man's problem and God's remedy. We realized, we looked at the society that we're living in today, and we saw that over the last hundred plus years, man has been running on a philosophy called humanism and humanism is man is at the center, man's wisdoms, man's laws, man's understanding. And we see that man has failed to deliver on the promise that he could build a better society without God. And so we saw that the problem was man had abandoned his creator. And we saw that the remedy 
is the faith of Jesus. Then we looked at the fact that the challenge is for the church. How is the church to fulfill the, the, the commission of go ye therefore into every nation, kindred, tongue, and people when the church itself is divided, the church itself is splintered off. And so the challenge is how do we unify? What will unify us? And we found that the message found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. I'm sorry, the faith of Jesus, have the faith of Jesus. And so in our last study, last night, we looked at Jesus's love for man. Jesus is love for man. And we saw that Jesus placed great value on the individual. We looked at the demoniac and we looked at how the demoniac was, was possessed with three to five and a half thousand demons. And yet Jesus went out of his way all the way through the storm, all the way to Gadara in order to set that man free. And we also talked about the woman caught in a, a, a adultery and how Jesus forgave her and said, go and sin no more. So our topic for tonight is Jesus and the Bible. What are we looking at? Jesus and the Bible. So when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus had a very high regard for scripture and he quoted it often. So I wanna look at some examples of how Jesus used the scripture. So in Matthew chapter 12, verse three, it says, but he said unto them, have ye not read what David did when he was a hundred and they that were with him? So here he says, have you not read? He's reminding them what the scripture says. In verse five, it says, or have you not read in the law? How that on the Sabbath days, the priests, in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. So he says, have you not read in David? Have you not read in the law? Then in chapter 19, verse four, Jesus says, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them what? Male and female. So here constantly we see Jesus is, is answering questions and objections by the word of God. He's questioning, have you not read? Chapter 21, verse 16, Jesus says, and Jesus saith unto them, yea, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And so one more says, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 10 says, and have ye not read this scripture? So here, what is Jesus doing? We're, we're trying to figure out what is the faith of Jesus. We see that Jesus used the scriptures constantly. He had to have it memorized. He says, have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Verse 26 says, have you not read in the book of Moses? So we know he, he referenced David. He referenced the law. He referenced the book of Moses, how in the bush, God spake unto him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So I have a question for us. Why did Jesus do what he's doing? Why did he do this? What do you all think? Why did you just type it into the chat? Why did Jesus uh, challenge people with, uh, have you not read? Have you not read? What, what was Jesus trying to get the people to understand or to know or to learn? You see, we're learning about the faith of Jesus. And what we're going to learn tonight is Jesus's faith was in the scripture. You see, Jesus wanted to call people's attention to the word and the need to study it more. Now, I, I think all of us could say that we need to put more attention on the word, and more importantly, we need to study it more. And so why did Jesus want people to study the word more? Notice what John chapter 5 verse 39 says. 
Jesus is speaking. He says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. So the people of his day, they thought that most of them had the first five books of the Bible memorized. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had it memorized. And so he says, you think that just because you know the scriptures, you automatically have eternal life. But notice he says, and they are they which what? They are they that testify of me. So Jesus is telling the people that just because you know the scriptures, the scriptures should actually lead you to me because I am the word made flesh. And so who was Jesus speaking to? In this context of John chapter five, he was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He was talking to the spiritual leaders of that time. Notice in verse 46, he says, for had you believed Moses, ye would have believed me, he wrote of me. So what was he telling them? If you would have believed what Moses wrote, well, what did Moses write? He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote the Torah, he wrote the law. And so he says, if you would have believed what Moses wrote, guess what? You would have believed me. Well, why Jesus? Because Moses wrote about me. So notice what Jesus does here. He refers people to the word of God in order that the word of God testifies of who he is. Now let's see how he applied this. So he said that Moses wrote of me. So that means the gospel had to be preached in the Old Testament. And so as we look at the writings of Moses, we go to creation. Right, Genesis chapter one, in the beginning was what? Uh, God, and so God created. And then we see that Moses wrote about the fall of man. And Moses also wrote about the first gospel promise, the first gospel sermon that was preached. He wrote Genesis 3.15. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna go to Genesis chapter three, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the first gospel message. Now, what does gospel mean? Gospel means good news. So in the context, man had sinned, right? Man had separated himself from God, and God comes, and he comes to the cool of the day. Man has tried to cover his sin by his own works, the fig leaves, and God comes and he offers a lamb. Notice what it says, Genesis chapter three, verse 15. It says, uh, starting with verse 15, it says, and I will put enmity, that word enmity means hatred. I will put enmity between thee. Now, who is thee? Thee, he's talking to the serpent. And, and he's really talking to the devil who used the serpent as a medium. So he says, I'm going to put hatred between you, Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed or your children and her children. So what do we learn from this? Here we see that there are two types of individuals living on planet Earth. There are those who are the seed of the woman and those who are the seed of the serpent. And we're gonna see that these two seeds are always at enmity or they're at war with each other. And he says, notice, because of what the serpent did, because Eve accepted the wicked wisdom of the serpent, that there would be a war, there would be what? Enmity. But notice what it goes on to say, but it, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head. So the promise is that there was gonna come a child and that child was gonna come from the lineage of Eve and he was going to do battle with the serpent and he was gonna crush the serpent's head. But notice it says, and thou the serpent shall bruise his heel. So in this battle, he would be bruised, he would be wounded. And this was the first promise 
that was saying that Jesus was going to come. Jesus was going to do battle with the enemy. And Jesus, yes, he would be wounded. Yes, he would be bruised. But in the end, he would crush the serpent's head. That is good news. Anybody say amen? That is good news. And so also, Moses wrote Numbers chapter 21. So he says, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me because Moses wrote about me. Let's go to Numbers chapter uh, 21, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. So here, the context is the children of Israel were in rebellion. They were in the wilderness. They were complaining. And so because of their complaining, their murmuring, their repining, God took his protection from them. And these fiery serpents that had always been there, but because the angels of the Lord encamped around about them, right, they were protected. So he removed his protection. They got bit. And they were dying, and Jesus, uh, God told Moses, I want you to make a serpent, and I want you to put it on a pole. And why? Notice, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So notice, here, anyone and everyone that looked at this serpent on a pole, when he looked at it, he would live. Now, notice Jesus takes these two texts. He takes these two scriptures, and now we're going to see how did Jesus apply them to himself. Now let's go to John chapter 3. So Jesus said, you search the scriptures, in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of who? Of me. So Jesus' faith, Jesus' belief in who he was and his mission came from the scripture. John chapter 3, verse 14. It says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so what is he referring to? He's referring to Numbers chapter 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the son of man be what? Lifted up. He says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. So in the same way that Moses lifted up the snake and that anybody who looked at the serpent would be healed, Jesus says the fulfillment of this prophecy he was talking about me. If you believe on me when I am lifted up, talking about the cross, and you believe, you will have eternal life. You see, Jesus was able to take the, 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 the scriptures, and he talked about the symbol, and then he says, I am the fulfillment. I am the reality. In, in theological language, it's called the type and the anti-type. So the type was the symbol, the reality anti-type was Jesus. So Jesus used scripture. Notice verse chapter five, verse 47. He says, but if you believe not his writings, well, who is his? If you don't believe Moses's writings, what will happen? He goes on to say, how shall you believe my words? Now this is critical. For us going forward, we have to believe what Moses wrote. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So Moses received the word of God and he wrote it down. And it was for the children of Israel. It was for the people of God throughout the, the generations. And if they would have believed what Moses wrote, then when Jesus, the Messiah, came, they would have believed him. That's Jesus' point. So they did not receive Jesus. So what Jesus is saying is you do not receive the word of God. 
You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they taught that the conquering king, the Messiah was going to be a conquering king and he was gonna come and bring back the glory. He was gonna bring Israel back to its heyday. But Jesus was showing them that no, he must first come as a suffering servant. You see, they wanted the conquering king but they did not want the suffering servant. Is that true today? <laughs> Do people want the, the, the prosperity? They want the, 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 the privileges of the gospel. They want the privileges of having a relationship with Jesus, but they don't want the suffering that comes along with it. True or false, right? So notice what uh, the, 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 the prophecy says that this, this Messiah would come and he would die. But notice how we come now. Jesus has been crucified, right? He died as the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what John said. And now we're gonna go post-resurrection. And now there are two disciples. They are dejected, they are disappointed and they are on the road to Emmaus. And so guess who shows up right next to them? And he comes as a stranger. And it says, let's go to Luke chapter 24. So we're looking how Jesus used the word of God. So we're gonna go to Luke 24. And so we see that Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. We're in Luke chapter 24, and we're gonna start with verse 25. Luke chapter 24, starting with verse, I mean, 25. Notice it says, now Jesus is speaking to them. They've been talking, they're lamenting, they're broken, they're dejected. And he says, oh fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. So he said to them, that they were fooled because they were slow to understand and believe what the prophets have spoken. So in one context, he says Moses, and now he says the prophets, right? So the law and the prophets, we must believe what was spoken. And then in verse 26, he says, ought not Christ to have what? Suffered these things? to enter into his glory. See, what had these two disciples been taught? They had been taught by the rabbis. They had been taught by the Pharisees who didn't understand that the Messiah would come as a suffering servant first, then he would come as a conquering king. And so he says, ought not these things to have happened? And so notice Isaiah chapter 53. Let's look at what the prophecy, what did the prophet say about the Messiah? Isaiah chapter 53, notice we're gonna highlight, and it says this prophet, this Messiah would come and it says he would be despised and rejected. They said he would be a man of sorrows. He said, acquainted with grief, smitten of God, oppressed and afflicted, as a lamb to the slaughter. So here this is describing the Messiah would come and he would be as a lamb or a sacrifice to the slaughter. Notice what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. John 1 29, what did he say? Behold the lamb of God. Now, if you were living in Israel at that time, they had the sanctuary service and anytime someone sinned, what did they have to bring? They had to bring a lamb. Go back to Genesis. What did they have to bring? They had to be a lamb. What did Cain and Abel have to bring? They had to bring a lamb. So the lamb was a, 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 a figure of Jesus. So when John sees Jesus, he sees the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and he says, behold the what? the lamb of God. And what was the purpose of the lamb? To take away the sins of the world. So Jesus came. And so he came as the humble lamb to lay down his life for sinners. And so they had the prophets, 
They had the law and they had John the Baptist pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Bible. But what did the Pharisees do? Did the Pharisees accept Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Absolutely not. Did they accept the message of John the Baptist? Absolutely not. And so we see that with their rejection of Jesus actually began in their rejection of Moses, in rejection of the prophets, and rejecting the prophet John the Baptist. And so how does this apply to us today? There are some people that say, hey, I don't read the Old Testament. I don't read this, or I read that. Or I, but Jesus says, if you want to know me, if you want to know what I believe and what I teach, you have to go and study the word of God. What was the only word of God that Jesus had? It was the old, what we call the Old Testament. So notice what the Pharisees, they focused on Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. They were focusing on Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, uh, his name shall be what? Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, uh, everlasting father, prince of peace, right? So this is the, the Messiah they wanted. And so notice, what does, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do to reveal himself to the two disciples on the road of, to Emmaus? Now think about it. What options did Jesus have? So he is now resurrected. He's in his glorified body. He could have appeared to them in all the glory and majesty of the risen Savior, angels singing. But is that what Jesus did? Notice what Jesus did. Notice Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Notice what it says, and beginning at, where did he begin? at Moses and all the prophets. So what does Jesus, instead of revealing himself in all his, his heavenly glory, Jesus decides to give these two disciples a Bible study. And it says he did it from memory, right? He didn't have Bibles like we had. He had to do it from memory. And so beginning at Moses, Genesis 3.15, and then he went through all of the scriptures and he taught them. It says, and he expounded unto them, how much of the scriptures? All of the scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself. So everything in the Old Testament was prophesying about who? Jesus. So if we don't understand the Old Testament, how can we understand Jesus? That's what the Bible's teaching us. In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So it's interesting. The Bible says, Psalm 119, 130 says, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It says in verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if we want to have the faith of Jesus, we must have our feet, our faith firmly planted on the word of God. So notice verse 31. So he's walking with them. He gives them this Bible study. See, they're walking from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. It's about a seven mile uh, 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 walk. So they had a couple hours and he's giving them this Bible study, right? And so notice it says, and their eyes were open. So now he comes in, they break bread, and it says, and their eyes were open, and they what? It says, and they knew him. It says, and he vanished out of their sight. So boom, Jesus is gone. Now, notice what they say, their response to this experience they had with Jesus. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and what did he do? And while he opened to us the scripture. Again, Jesus used scripture to prove who he was. He didn't do some divine manifestation. He wanted their faith to be in the scripture and the scripture alone. So now let's go to the upper room. So what do those two disciples do? 
they get so excited, they run all the way back up to Jerusalem and they tell the disciples, we have seen the Messiah. We have seen the Messiah. And so uh, somebody you need to uh, mute yourself uh, on mm -hmm. Zoom, iPhone, you need to mute yourself. Uh, so notice we're in Luke 24. Luke 24, I'm sorry. Thank you, baby. I'm sorry, excuse me. Somebody's iPhone. Okay, and... it's almost done. And then call at it, call at it. It's time to eat. Call at it now. And Melinda, she needs to eat. You're, you're talking. Uh huh. You're talking. But I it's can almost hear you. done, the bread. Oh, mercy. Can, oh, there she is. Mute. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Sorry about that, everybody. All right. So let's go back. Um, where are we going? Right here. All right. All right, let's, let's, uh, we're going to say another prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to bless us as we continue our study in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, where is Jesus? He's, uh, where are the disciples? They're in the upper room. Luke 24, 44, it says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. So Jesus is talking. He reveals himself to the disciples in the upper room. And what does he refer them to? These are the words that I had told you before my passion. Notice what it says. He says that all these things must be fulfilled, which were what? Written where? In the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So now, Jesus, what did he do in the upper room? He gives another Bible study. So notice it says, he's showing them how he is the fulfillment of all the things written in the law of Moses, all the things that were written in the prophets, and the things that were written in the Psalms concerning himself. So what does this teach us about the faith of Jesus? You see, the faith of Jesus was based on the word of God. And so if we want to have the faith of Jesus, we must do the same. So question, why did Jesus take all this time, effort, and energy to give the disciples this biblical uh, uh, reference to himself? What does this teach us today? You see, the Bible was central to all Jesus lived and taught. Jesus not only knew the Bible, but he lived it out in his daily life and taught others to do the same. So we must know the Bible. That's important. But information without transformation or application can never lead to demonstration. I'm going to say that again. Just having information without having a heart transformation will never be able to really understand the application of what we're reading so there can be no demonstration of the character of God. You see, let's listen to Jesus as he teaches. So now we're going to see how did he use it in public when he's talking to people. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Where are we going? Luke chapter 6, verse 36. It says, now, Jesus is talking to people who want to be his followers. They want to follow him. He says, why do you call me Lord or master? And you say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that which I say? So he's questioning them. He said, hey, you say you want to follow me, right? You say you want to be a disciple of me. But guess what? You're not even following what I'm asking you to do. Notice in Matthew 7, verse 21, similar situation. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, master, master, shall enter the, king of the kingdom of heaven. He says, but he that what? Do it. So the Bible says, not the hearers of the word, but the doers will be justified before God. It says, he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. He said, many. How many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful work. So here are these people, they come to Jesus, they call him Lord, and they say, hey, we preached in your name. We prophesied in thy name. We what? We even cast out devils in your name. Lord, we did many good. What are they highlighting? Works. Now notice the response. He says, and then will I profess unto them. So now Jesus is responding to these people who claim to be his believers, right? He says, I never... What's that word? I never knew you. Wait, Lord, you are, um, you're omniscient. You know everything. Not that he didn't know. He says, I never had a close, intimate, and personal relationship with you because you heard my words, but then you did your own thing. I never knew you. Notice he says, depart from me, ye that work. Remember, they were flaunting their works. Ye that work iniquity. Now, what is iniquity? There are three types of, of sin in the Bible. There's sin, there's transgression, and then there's iniquity. Sin is when we know what God says, right, to do, and we don't do it. Transgression are the actions that we do in our disobedience, and iniquity is the influence we have on others because of our disobedience. He says, not only did you sin, not only did you transgress, but you used your influence to work against me. Wow. So let's look. Jesus takes the word seriously. And guess what? So should we. If we call ourselves Christians, we have to take the word of God, what? Seriously. And so why is it important that we take the word of God seriously? You see, words communicate our thoughts and thoughts are our words made audible, right? So, so words communicate our thoughts and our, our words are our thoughts made audible. So thoughts reveal the character of the man. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so notice that God's word reveals his thoughts and his divine character. So the Bible is God revealing his thoughts to you. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and, and to prosper you and to give you an expected end. So when you are struggling, I wonder if anybody loves me. He says, as a woman may forget her suckling child, yes, they may, what, forget, but I will never forget. Oh, Lord, I have graven you in the palms of my hand. These are the thoughts of God toward you. He says, I love you with an everlasting love, and with cords of love and kindness, I'm drawing you. These are the thoughts of God toward you. You see, what does God, how, who does God, sorry, reveal his thoughts to? That's a good question. Who does God reveal his thoughts to? Notice, and for what purpose does God reveal his thoughts? Notice Isaiah 28. This is going to give us a, a, a biblical principle on how and who God reveals his thoughts to. He asked a question, who shall he teach knowledge? So if God is infinite in wisdom, infinite in knowledge, infinite in power, he's the creator, right? He's the redeemer. He's the restorer. He says, I am ready to teach. Who can I teach this wonderful knowledge? And whom shall we make to understand? So God doesn't just want to teach just to be teaching. He wants to teach so that we can understand. And what does he want us to understand? Who can we make understand doctrine? Now, that's a bad word to some Christians. Oh, I don't believe in doctrine. I just want Jesus. But guess what? Jesus he says, I want to teach you, I want to give you understanding, and doctrine just means teaching. And so notice the answer. He's looking for students. Who can we teach this heavenly wisdom to? 
He says, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the bread. He said, they can't be babes. <laughs> they have to be mature. They have to be off the milk, right? And so notice what he says. Well, how does he teach us then? So once we get off the rudimentary, the, the elementary, and we get teeth, so to speak, how does he teach us? It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. So God does not reveal everything at once. You see, we have to go to the word. We have to go precept upon precept, precept upon precept. And then he says, what? Uh, I'm sorry. It says line upon line, line upon line. So that means we have to read this scripture and compare it with this other scripture and then see what the whole, because what did Jesus do? He said, beginning at Moses and all through the prophets, he went precept upon precept, line upon line. And then he says what? Here a little and there a little. You see, God is not going to give us more than we can bear. That's a promise from the Bible. He, he gradually shows us as much as we can grasp, understand, and apply to our daily life. Jesus often talked to disciples and said, there are many things that I want to tell you, but you are not ready. So God is not going to give us something that we're not ready or mature enough to receive. And so notice Mark chapter 4, verse 28. Mark chapter 4, verse 28. He's going to give us a principle of how God reveals truth to his children. He says, for the earth brings forth fruit of herself. So he's talking about gardening now. So he's going to use an illustration of seed bearing and harvest, right? It says, first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full ear, corn in the ear. So here we see the, the, the agricultural reference. So you go out and you plant the seed. If you look at the seed of the parable, of the seed of the sower, the seed is the word of God. Those of you who are taking notes, that's Matthew 13. The seed is the word of God. And he says, when the word is planted, does it immediately spring up? No, it says first the blade, then the ear, and then the full ear. So this is how we're to grow in Christ. He's not going to tell us everything at once. He wants us to grow in grace. And so we're going to see that it is written was Jesus's authority. We're talking about the faith of Jesus here, right? What did Jesus place his faith in? Notice, we're going to go to the desert, and we're going to see how Jesus used the word of God as his authority. Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter four, this is the temptation. So Jesus, he's led by the spirit into the wilderness to commune and connect with the father. He's there for 40 days and notice the tempter says, now who's the tempter? Here we see it is the devil. And he doesn't come to him like how he is painted in, in, in popular culture with horns and bats wings and, and foot. No, he comes as an angel of light. He comes as a deceiver. And notice Jesus has been fasting and praying. And notice what the devil does. It says, the tempter said, first word out of his mouth, if thou be the son of God. If thou be the son of, so what does the tempter do? He questions his divinity. He questions his sonship. He questions his authority. He questions his mission. Because right now it doesn't look like he's the son of God. He's, he's hungry. He's emaciated. He's, he's, he's fasting and praying. He's at the end of his fast. He's at his weakest moment. You notice that's what the devil does, right? He comes to us when we're weak. Right, But the Bible says, when we are weak, we can be strong in him. He says, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You see, Satan 
always questions the word of God. Satan always questions the word of God. See, he hates the word of God. He despises the word of God. And he does not want us to have clear understanding of the word of God. You see, just a few, uh, a month and a half before this experience, Jesus was baptized. And the Bible says that when he was baptized, he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and there was a voice that came out of heaven and said, this is my what? Beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So did Jesus know who he was? Did the father validate that this is my son? Absolutely. But see, notice Satan, he, the, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. So he questions the sonship of God. He questions the word of God. And notice in Genesis chapter three in the garden, what's the first thing he says? He says, yea, hath God said. So he questions Eve. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from every tree of the garden? And so what is he doing? He's casting doubt. He, he's trying to get Eve to question the word of God. But Satan always casts doubt and, uh, and questions the word of God. So what was Jesus' response? We're trying to see, what, what was Jesus' response to the devil? You know, Jesus was hungry. And, and did he have power to turn those stones into bread? Absolutely. But guess what? Jesus would not use his divinity in order to overcome because he's our example. I can't turn stones into bread. You can't turn stones into bread. So Jesus humbled himself and he subjected himself to the same things that we have at our disposal. So notice, Jesus says, Matthew 4, verse 4, it is is written. But what was Jesus's defense? He didn't say, uh, he didn't work a miracle. He, didn't, he says, it is written. He says, man shall not what? Live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter eight. If you're taking notes, that's Deuteronomy chapter eight. He quotes the scripture as the authority on why he is doing what he's doing. So, Satan says, okay, you want to quote scripture? He says, if thou, this is the second if, second temptation, if thou be the son of God, what does he say? Cast thyself down. So he is, this is the second temptation. The first one was on appetite. Now the second one, he says, for it is written. Wait, did you know that Satan can quote the scripture? Satan knows the Bible. And so Satan says, oh, you want to quote scripture? I can match scripture with scripture. He says, for it is written, now he's quoting uh, 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 Psalm 91, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, list, list at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Now, did he quote scripture? Yes, he did. Did he quote it correctly? No, he did not. He partially quoted Psalm 91. If you were to read Psalm 91, it's, it, notice, let's go to Psalm 91. We got to look it up for ourselves. Let's go to Psalm 91. What is the section that, that Satan left out? Psalm 91, verse 1. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow or the protection of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, right? He is my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. So he didn't quote that part. He didn't want Jesus to put his quote, his, his trust in the Father. Notice what it says, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler or from the noisome pestilence, that goes for COVID, by the way, it says, and he shall cover thee with his feathers, under his wings shalt thou trust, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler, and so notice, Satan left all those promises out of his scripture quotation, 
He went all the way down and he wanted Jesus to be presumptuous. If Jesus would have thrown himself down, he would have taken himself out from under the shadow of the Almighty. He would have taken himself out of the refuge and the fortress. And that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to take ourselves away from the fortress of God's word and put it on human philosophy, put it on bishops and prelates. And, and no, we must follow Jesus. And his example was, it is written. So what did Jesus say? It is written again. He was like, oh, you want to go? I have another scripture. It is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So notice Jesus, in order to have the faith of Jesus, not just having faith in Jesus, we have to know, uh, thus saith the Lord, it is written. So now Satan, with the third temptation, Matthew chapter 4, verse 9, now the real character comes out. What did Satan really want? from Jesus. He offers him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, he says, all these things will I give thee. This is powerful. He says, I have power. I have a uh, uh, power and I can give you. You don't have to die. You don't have to sacrifice. You don't have to suffer, Jesus. I am the God of this world. I'll give it to you. But all you have to do is what? If thou will fall down. And what does he really want? Oh, he wants worship. What, is, what does Satan want? He wants worship. Why? Because we're going to see that he wants to be like the most high God and only God is worth our worship. Now notice Jesus, temptation chapter three. What does he say? He says, temptation number three, then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, get thee behind me, Satan. And he's speaking with authority, for it is written, thou shalt what? Worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So Jesus understood who he was talking to. He knew from the very beginning that this was the voice of the devil. And finally, he says, yes, you've revealed yourself. You want worship. He says, but no, you shall worship the Lord your God, him only shalt thou serve. So the way we worship, according to Jesus, it tells God who we serve. So how we worship tells God how and who we serve. Joshua says, choose you this day, what? Whom you will serve. So Jesus here gives us an example of how to overcome when we are tempted. You see, Jesus used the word as a weapon. Notice Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, now Paul, he's writing, and notice he's talking about the armor of God. What is he talking about? The armor of God. And in Ephesians chapter 6, what is the word of God. Anybody, what is the word of God? Type it in the chat. What is the word of God? In Ephesians chapter six, he says, take the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, take the what shield of faith, take the, the, the belt of truth, take the, the gospel of uh, the, the, your, your feet shod with gospel. And he says, take the sword, of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we see that Jesus, he had his sword sharp, ready for battle. How about you today? Those of us who call ourselves Christians, and do we know the word of God well enough? So if somebody is going to teach us something, we can say, thus saith the Lord. It is written. You see, that what, that is our example from Jesus. So whether you be male or female, boy or girl, we need the sword of the spirit. So when Jesus was challenged or questioned, guess what he used to answer? He used scripture to answer. Let's look at Luke. So we're going through the life of Jesus and we're seeing how did Jesus use the word of God? 
how central was it to having the faith of Jesus? Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25. It says, now this is another situation, and a certain lawyer, right? So he's a, a, a lawyer, he knows the law. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted or tested him saying, master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So now here comes this lawyer. He's an expert in the law and he's questioning Jesus. And what is his question? His question was, how can I be saved? How can I have eternal life? I believe he already had an answer in his mind. You know, sometimes people just want to see what you'll say. But notice Jesus, notice what his answer is. He said unto him, what is written in the law? So Jesus says, no, 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 no. He didn't give him his opinion. He didn't say, well, I think, or I, he says, no, what is written in the law? Where did he refer this man to? He referred him back to scripture. And then he says, how readest thou? What do you understand? the way of eternal life is, young man. What do you understand? So Jesus didn't just go about telling people, he wanted people to have an understanding. The Bible says, get wisdom, get knowledge, but in all thy getting, get understanding. Many Christians, many people have no idea what they believe or why they believe it. You ask them, they say, I gotta go ask my pastor. Well, I thought you were a follower of Jesus. Well, I got to go ask this person. I got to go to this commentary. I got to go. No, we need to know a thus saith the Lord for ourselves. How do you understand? That's what Jesus says. Notice, and answering and said, this is his answer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and what? Thy neighbor as thyself. So according to this scripture, he's quoting that God wants us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind, and the test is how we treat our neighbor. Wow. So, and he said unto him, thou has answered right. He says, this is Jesus now, this do and thou shalt live. So Jesus says, hey, you understand. So understanding is not enough. He says, now you have to take what you understand and actually go and do something with it. And the New Testament says, not the hearers of the word, but the doers of the word will be saved. So are you a hearer only? Or are you a doer of God's word? This is what it means to have the faith of Jesus. So question, why such a big emphasis on scripture and its authority? Why did Jesus put such emphasis on the scripture and its authority? You see, John chapter one says, very famous, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is almost a direct quotation from Genesis chapter one, but now it's saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14 says, and the word, the logos, right? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. See, remember God's word is God's thoughts made audible, but the Bible says, God's thought actually came in the flesh. Jesus is the word of God. And it says, dwelt among us. We do, beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of what? Grace and truth. Do, do we need Jesus to show grace on us? Amen. Do we need him to know the truth? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You see, Jesus is God's word, God's thoughts, God's grace, God's love made visible, tangible, right? And so Jesus reveals the character of God the Father. You see, so what are some lessons we can learn? 
You see, notice what John chapter 10, John chapter 10. Let's go. What are some lessons we can learn from the life of Jesus about the word of God, the sword of the spirit? John chapter 10, and we're going to go to verse 34 to 36. It says, John chapter 10, starting with verse 34. It says, Jesus answered them, it is, not is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If ye call them gods, unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Now, what in the world is going on? So notice, Jesus was constantly pestered by the scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers, and they were constantly challenging him on scripture. You see, Jesus didn't go to their schools. He was not a part of the rabbinical school system. Actually, Jesus was homeschooled. And he studied and he prayed and he, and he got the word of God from the spirit of God. And so notice, they were constantly challenging him and challenging him. They wanted to know, right? So notice what it says. The Jews answered him saying, so they wanted to stone him, right? The Jews answered him saying, uh, saying for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. See, Jesus had said, that he was the son of God. And so they said, no, this is blasphemy. And they took up stones to stone him. And because thou being a man, makest thyself God. So here, just a quick side note. What is blasphemy according to the Bible? Any man that maketh himself to God or to stand in the place of God or have the prerogatives of God or to do the things only God can do, to receive worship, to forgive sin, to do all these. And guess what? They constantly questioned Jesus, but Jesus was the only man who could rightly say, thy sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. Jesus was, and he proved it to them, but notice they challenged him. So notice verse 34, now we're gonna go back. It says, Jesus answered them. So they're taking up stones. They want to kill him. What is his defense of what he just says? Is it not written? So what was Jesus' defense? He didn't say, yo, yo, stop. No, he said, is it not written? So he's reminding them in your law. It wasn't their law, but he's, he's making emphasis and he said, now he's quoting Psalm 85, verse 6, ye are gods. Now that word means judges. In the context of the, the verse, the judges were supposed to be uh, rulers over the people, taking care of the people. And so the word gods actually means judges. He says, if he called them gods or magistrates or rulers unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. So what is Jesus saying? He's like, hey, if they are rulers, if they are magistrates, if they are judges, how much more am I, the son of God, not to rule, not to judge, not to lead? And then he says something very important. The scripture cannot be broken, meaning no matter what man does against it, no matter what man does to try to destroy it, try to contaminate it, guess what? This book, this scripture cannot be broken. The word of God, the Bible says, will not go void. Guess what? We're living in a time where people have literally burned this book. People have died, they've persecuted, and guess what? People are dying for the word of God right now, but guess what? Still, the number one book sold in the world is the Bible, because it's more than a book. This is God's thoughts written out as instructions for the believer. So if you want the faith of Jesus, we must believe that the scriptures cannot be broken. 
He says, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. I want to I want to get you that in your mind. Whether whatever you've been taught, the word of God, it is forever and it is eternal, and it says it 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 will not go void. You see, forever, this is Psalms 11989. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled where? <laughs> so God's word is settled in heaven. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray in earth as it is in heaven. So whose word reigns supreme in heaven? It's God's word. So in the life of the believer, the word must be the foundation. If you are not building your, your, your character, your life, your belief system off the word of God, the Bible says the foolish man built his house upon the sand. But the wise man built his house upon the rock. And the Bible says that rock, that cornerstone is Jesus Christ. And the winds and the, and, and the waves and the storms of life will blow against us. But guess what? When we are founded firmly on the word of God, it says it will beat up against that house. But guess what? It will not fall. Are you firmly planted in the word of God? Do you understand the word of God for yourself? Or are you listening to other people telling you what God says? If you are, you do not have the faith of Jesus. Jesus' faith was in the word of God. You see, we are living in a time where God is looking for a people. Go with me to our, our verse that we've been looking at. We're coming to a close. Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. 12. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Notice what it says. It says, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep. That word keep means protect. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We can see how the word of God and the, the, the faith of Jesus are connected. You cannot separate them. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are connected. And it says that they have patience. Here is the patience. Well, how do they get that patience? Turn with me to James. I'm sorry. I keep saying the last verse. I'm not going to say that anymore. James chapter 1. How do the saints get patience? James chapter 1, starting with verse 2. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. So how do we get patience, the patient saints? It says the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work. So in order to have perfect faith, we have to have perfect patience, and that patience only comes by trials. He says, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. Then he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally, and withhold or upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So notice that if you are lacking understanding, if you're lacking wisdom, if you're lacking a solid foundation for your faith, Jesus says, here is the patience of the saints. Well, how do I get patience? I have to be tested. Your faith has to be tested and it must be tested by the word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, God's word leads us to the cross. God's word leads us to grace and faith and love and hope. And God's word will get us all the way home. And so the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, and the Bible says the word 
became flesh. So if I believe in Jesus, I have to believe in the law, in the prophets, in the both New and Old Testament. I hope this is clear to you because some people have been taught that they only need this. They, no, we need everything that Jesus had. And Jesus says, come and follow me. And so I want to thank you for joining us for another night. Uh, I believe that uh, the Lord has, has, has blessed. And I want to encourage you, if you have not uh, watched the first uh, three presentations, go back on and watch the first three presentations. They are so foundational to what we're doing. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pastor Wire, and then he'll close us out, and then we'll have a few announcements at the end. You're on mute. You're on mute, Pastor. Helps when you get that unmuted, don't you? <laughs> anyway, just uh, thank you for making that so very clear uh, that Jesus lived and taught by every word out of the mouth of God. And uh, as his followers, we should do the same. Uh, I want to also want to encourage you, some of you may be uh, first time with us, that on our Rogers Adventist Church Facebook page, we also have some other events that happened earlier in the year. Mark Anthony presented a program on how to optimize our immune system. It's very, very good. And then Nancy Redesell also had an event called Living Healthy in an Unhealthy World and Learning How to Prepare Foods that Support Optimal Health. And then in February, Sharon, Sharon Gamboa did a series on Food for Thought, which deals with how we can improve our mental health. Uh, I think you'll find all of those very um, informative and a blessing to you as well. So let us close with a prayer of thanksgiving tonight. Father in heaven, we're grateful again for the wonderful love that you have shown us in the gift of your only begotten son, Jesus. And that when we look to Jesus in faith, believing that he died for our sins and that when we confess our sins, as your word says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, Lord, we can come to you just the way we are and cast our sins upon Jesus. He'll take them gladly from us and he'll give us his righteousness Amen. and give to us the wonderful gift of eternal life. Now, Father, until we gather again tomorrow evening, bless us, be with us, and may we look to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who are on Facebook, and if you want to uh, join uh, the Zoom uh, question and answer, here is the Zoom uh, uh, ID number. Uh, it's 820 zero five eight four nine seven uh five five and the um the uh password is jesus and so those of you who are on zoom uh we're just going to have a, a short uh question and answer any comments and uh we'll let the facebook go we'll see you guys tomorrow god bless you and those of you who are on zoom you can unmute yourself and if you have any comments, any questions, anything that you would like to say, feedback, uh, this is your time to uh, respond. Don't be shy.